turn to four, 431, if that's okay. 431. Jesus has a table spread where the saints have got a bed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. It is man to be the king and supplies of every need. Oh, tis sweet to stop with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calls it, come and dine. You may please the Jesus table all the time. He who the multitude, and the water into wine. To the hungry call it now, come and dine. Disciples came to land, but so they Christ come in. For the plans he called to him, oh, come and die. There they found the hearts he lost, bread and fish on the cross. So we satisfy the hungry every time. Come and dine, the master called it, come and dine. You may feast the Jesus table all the time. We will the multitude, turn the water into wine. To the hungry call it now. The land will take his right to be ever at his side. All the hosts of heaven will assemble thee. All will be a glorious sight. All the saints are spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may be Jesus' faithful all the time. He who fed the multitude, turn the water into wine, to the country calleth now. Four seventy eight, I would have one. Four seventy eight. I will call upon the Lord. I will
488. 488. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. Six oh six. Wonderful grace of Jesus, great in all my sin.
Good morning. Good to see each one of you this morning. Uh, what a wonderful day the Lord has made for us today. I hope and trust that um, you have enjoyed uh, the song service. Uh, what more enjoyment can a child of God have other than singing praises to the one that saved them for all eternity? taking their sins upon him at the cross at Calvary, that they would have eternal life in him. That's the song to sing about. So good morning. Welcome uh, to the uh, Bear Creek Association uh, fifth Sunday meeting, the last day of 2023. Tomorrow be 2024. Time goes by pretty rapidly. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's about impossible for me to contemplate a place where there is no time. 
that there is a place where there is no time. So welcome once again. Uh, we're thankful for the song service. We're thankful to the Lord for our um, faithful song leaders. We pray the Lord's continued blessing upon them. Uh, we'd like to welcome Elder Travis Williams with us and Elder Tim McGrady, Elder Travis Williams. Um, uh, I think he's familiar to, to most, if not all of us. Uh, he pastors Leapers Fork Primitive Baptist Church near Nashville, Tennessee. So we're good to have him and his family with us today. Uh, we, um, we're just glad to see him and glad to have him. We pray the Lord's blessing upon him as he comes and uh, preaches to us today. <clears throat> and Tim McGrady, which we should all know by now, he's been with us Friday and Saturday, and he's with us today. So we're really praying for you, Brother Tim. Uh, he's brought forth some blessed teaching uh, to us. Uh, yesterday, speaking about uh, baptism and things of that nature and uh, the purpose of it and the reason for it. So we're thankful uh, for him, and we just ask the Lord's blessing upon him. He um, pastors Bellspur, Dan River, and Green Hill in the Virginia area, so we just pray the Lord's continued blessing upon him and his ministry. It's good to have Elder James Carlock and his family with us, and Elder Charles Smith, it's good to see him and all the visitors uh, supporting this from our uh, sister churches. It's just good to see each one of you. Uh, seems like it's um, few and far between that we're able to assemble this way. So it's uh, very precious and uh, I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. Uh, we do have several that we'd like to mention as we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we, um, Continue to be in prayer for Sister uh, Lisa and Brother Mike. She's uh, recovering well. Uh, I asked Brother Mike how she was doing this morning, and uh, he says she's doing awesome, and uh, what a great blessing it is from the Lord uh, following her surgery. Uh, card I'd like to read, it says you're one, of the, you're one of God's most special gifts. God brings people into our lives who see with the most understanding eyes encourage with the most gentle words and love with the most caring heart. So grateful for the gift of you. Thank you for all the prayers. I don't know how to put it into words to tell you how much it means to me. God bless you all. Love, Sister Lisa. So we continue to be in prayer for her. Uh, we want to remember that family in our prayers. Uh, we continue to be in prayer for Elder Jamie Hancock. We ask the Lord's continued blessing upon him. Uh, Brother Curtis Fur said, <clears throat> sent me a note this morning, uh, said that uh, he continues to do better. His back is sore, of course, but he's able to move around. So we pray the Lord's continued blessing upon him. And he also emphasized that he would like to uh, send his love to the church. And thank you from the bottom of his heart that uh, you've uh, thought of him in prayer and lifted him up that way, uh, as well as the phone calls and encouraging words. So he said, thank you, and he loves you. So we want to remember. Uh, Brother Curtis Fur, Ned Honeycutt, Brother Terry Honeycutt, we continue to be in prayer for him. His brother let me know that uh, he will be, uh, hospice will be uh, coming in today. So we just ask the Lord's uh, mercy and grace upon that family. Um, Sister Tammy Hooven's father, we want to remember him in prayer. Uh, he is pretty low, and the uh, Hoovens are up there visiting with him down there visiting with him. Uh, so we ask the Lord's blessing upon him and that family. Uh, we continue to pray for our country. We ask the Lord's blessing and mercy upon us and our leaders. Uh, we're thankful to the Lord for our military. We pray the Lord's blessing upon them as well as first responders and uh, things like that. We have so much to be thankful for in a natural way. We have many natural blessings. Uh, but the spiritual blessings truly do supersede all of those. Uh, so let us, we hope and trust that the Lord would bless us to think on the spiritual things that we have in heavenly places in Christ Jesus today. I hope and trust that each one of you will continue to pray as we meet this morning. Uh, is there anyone else would like to call out uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer? All right. Um, so we'd like to stand and sing a hymn. We're going to ask Elder Carlock, if he would, to open service with prayer 
uh, followed by Elder Travis Williams, and then we'll have Elder Tim McGrady come forth, uh, hoping and trusting all in the power and the demonstration of the Spirit. So, I hope that you're looking forward to this and anxious for the message. Continue to pray. Brother Gene, what number do you have? Number 42. Number 42. Lord, in thy presence, here we be. May we Help us that we would praise thy holy name as we should. Please help us that it would be lifted up above all others, and that all distractions that would take our minds off of it would be eliminated. Lord, we pray for the remainder of the service and the preaching that's to come. Please bless it with thy spirit. Please bless it to our edification. Please help us as we hear. Lord, we pray for thy kingdom here, not just during this service, but that it would be manifest brightly in this community and in each community that's represented in each of our lives, each one with whom we have contact. Lord, we, we pray for those who are sick and those who are in need. Please give them those things which they need. Lord, we pray for ourselves that we would be given wisdom, that we would be given our daily needs. Please bless us today with the sustenance we need for today. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Please help us to be forgiving of one another and to love one another. Lord, please lead us away from sin. Please grant us repentance that we may, as we go forward into this new week, this new month, and this new year, that we may live more and more like thy true disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do count it a great privilege by his grace that that burden still remains in our heart to present these bodies. 
and that he would bless us with his felt presence that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. I certainly need your prayers. I appreciate all the prayers that's gone before. There is a wonderful power in prayer. He's a God of wonder. And I hope you continue to pray. I want to begin with some scriptures that are recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Verse 10 there, the Bible tells us, it says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the sheep, shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. There the Bible clearly tells us that I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There the Bible continues on to use the contrast of the hireling to highlight what our Lord and Savior had just said to us. When things are seen in contrast, they stand out. They stand separate from each other. I want you to consider yourself for just a minute to be a sheep out there in the pasture. And you're guided and you're being overseen by a hireling. And the wolves come and that hireling flees. Well, you would be left in constant fear your peace would be dissolved in every day of your life. But there's a good shepherd that oversees those sheep. That one who was willing to defend those sheep by laying down his life. And the Bible tells us there, he says, I giveth my life for the sheep. There's been a lot of discussion that I've heard over my short span of life as to what that life there, those lives, what is that in context of? What is that talking about? I believe with all my heart that life Many of God's people live this life in peace. Many of God's people live this life being overshadowed by his rich grace and mercy. And they don't know it. That more abundant life there, I believe with all my heart, is to teach us of that New Testament church kingdom here on this earth. Certainly we know that that life he was speaking of was that natural life right here inside the boundaries of time because it was the life that he was speaking of that he would lay down. That New Testament church kingdom here in this life. What a wonderful blessing it is, Sister Jean said to me this morning as I greeted her, how wonderful it was to have this kingdom here on this earth. We know it's a heavenly kingdom. It come down here. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and it come down here. The word became flesh and he said, on this rock, I'll build my church. We know without any excuse 
that right here inside the boundaries of this time world exist a heavenly kingdom. And yes, we all should sincerely consider the blessing that it is to have this kingdom. Certainly by his love and grace and mercy, he give it to us. I don't believe it would be that far stretch of the imagination to say that he could have left us here without it. You see, that's how we see these things in the contrast of each other. Imagine what this life would be without it. In my life, I have pondered, I have prayed, and I have asked the Lord to help me to better understand and to be able to confidently stand before God's people and share with them what a complete, true experience of life inside that church kingdom is like here on this earth. I've had many discussions, some of the most intense discussions that I've ever had about the experience of this church kingdom here on this earth has been with my dear mother. And what I've mainly been told and what I've mainly been exposed to about that experience here in this church kingdom is the joys and the glad tidings of it. And that's absolutely true. There's no doubt that this kingdom contains joy and glad tidings. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, preached glad tidings of the kingdom. But it didn't always match my experience. It seemed like so many times I felt as I was being devoured. I found myself running. And it seemed like that for a great time period in my experience, dealing and being involved with this kingdom here on this earth, that that was my experience. And I struggled to understand why people would constantly tell me that it's all wonder or wonderful and it's all joy. You know, out here in the secular world, if you manage people, you have to understand about something about managing expectations. You have to understand something about managing expectations. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this perfect, infallible book that he wrote, did a proper job, did a perfect job managing the expectations of the child of God. I understand the imagination is vain. The imagination is vain. And I certainly do not rely on my imagination. It seemed to me that a lot of the experiences that were shared with me about that experience in this kingdom mainly come from someone's imagination. The Bible tells us, and maybe we'll get to this uh, scripture in a few, to be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed. And that's a lesson that any true God called man better understand. He better lay aside everything, every notion, every imagination, every experience. It all comes from this book, nowhere else. So I guess many days ago, I had asked the Lord to help me go into this book and pull out of it what is that true, complete experience to live in that New Testament church kingdom here on this earth. <clears throat> I love the scripture of Romans 1 and 20. The Bible tells us there, for the invisible things of him are clearly seen by the things that are made. That's wonderful understanding. The natural will always match the spiritual in every case, in every place. 
And if it don't, you ain't got the truth. The natural has to match the spiritual. The spiritual has to match the natural. You see, we can see these invisible things by the things that are made. If I had to ask you this morning, what would be some of the things that your expectations would contain to live inside this New Testament church kingdom? What would be some of your expectations? I think most of you would probably agree that in this kingdom that you'd want to be healed. We need a spiritual healing. We need a physical healing in every day of our lives. I think most of you's expectation in this kingdom would be that you would want to be fed, that you would want to be nourished, and that you would want to be taught the things of God, and that you wouldn't want to be taught by man. You'd want to be taught by God himself. You'd want to be fed by God himself. So let's go into the scriptures for just a few minutes and consider some of the places where Jesus healed, where Jesus fed, and where he taught. I'm going to try to be kind of quick with a couple of these and then maybe take a few more minutes on a couple other ones. First one that comes to my mind was uh, it's recorded in Mark 2, where Jesus was teaching in a house. He was preaching in a house. And the multitude, the press of people, there was just a press of people around the house, even so much about the door that they couldn't get to him. And those dear brothers took a man of the palsy and took him up on the roof and they uncovered that roof and they laid that let that man down in a bed to get him there in front of Jesus because there's so many people around him they couldn't get to him <laughs> and Jesus saw their faith he saw their faith you know, the Bible tells us that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And he pronounced that man to rise up and walk, that his sins were forgiven him. And if we consider that natural experience, because that was a real life event that naturally took place. You know, if me and brother Eddie and brother Tim and Eric had a brother out here in the parking lot that was sick, sick of the palsy, Jesus was in this building preaching to us, couldn't get him in here. Could you just consider the labor and the effort that endurance that it would have required to carry that bed up on that build on this building top and pull away that roof and let that man down in his presence that would not have been no easy task by any stretch of the imagination i think about that dear sister that's recorded there in uh, Mark 5 and Luke that had had a disease of the blood for 12 years. She had had a disease of the blood for 12 years. It's been all she had had and could not be healed. And Jesus had come through and there again the throng and the press of people had him so closely surrounded that she had to wade through that press of people because she knew in her heart by that faith 
that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that she would be made whole. And she was. She made her way through all those people. And she touched the hem of his garment, and she was made whole. You know, we consider the scriptures in Matthew 14, where John the Baptist had just been killed. Jesus had went up on that mountain apart to pray. And he saw a great multitude following. And the disciples, you know, I'm going to turn over there real quick. The disciples had even said to him, In verse 15, Matthew 14, verse 15, the Bible says there, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the village and buy themselves some victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. You see that multitude there. They were in a desert place. They were in a desert place. And that desert place that the Bible is describing to us right there is the very same type desert place that you see in your mind right now it's a desert place you know i've often said to congregations this and i'll say it to you this morning verse 19 says and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass now, somewhere in all that, it went pretty quickly from a desert place to they sit down on grass. I don't know that at this point in my life that the Lord has given me the light to see that scripture. Maybe you know, or if you do, you go home and study, and then when if you see the light in it, share it with me. I'd like to know. We know the Bible goes on to say that they were filled and that they carried away 12 baskets of fragments that remained. I'll go real quickly over to, uh, I believe it's Luke 5. There he, um, well, let me just turn over there. came to pass that as people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of that ship. So... Let us be mindful that we've already covered an environment where Jesus healed. We've already covered an environment where Jesus fed. And now we're going to deal with the last one for just a few minutes, that environment in which he taught. And I hope that as you read your Bible, your mind becomes full of questions. The question that has always come to my mind as I read that scripture is there was perfectly solid, dry ground right there. Why did Jesus choose to get in a ship 
and to be cast out, thrust out on the water. And he sat down in that ship to teach the people. You know, if we consider just for a minute the natural laws of water, why is it that water will float a boat? Naturally, that boat displaces the water underneath it. That water creates a pressure or a resistance against that boat that will cause that ship to float. That's why they can take ships and make them weigh tons and tons and tons and sell them all the way across the oceans. Who is it that put those natural laws in that ability of the water? Well, you see, that's God's law. And you see, it'll be his law that holds up this kingdom. You see, in that ship, it's not stable ground. It's not stable ground. So, when we go back and we look at these experiences in their completeness, and we see that environment of that kingdom here on this earth, will you see where they let that man down through the roof that was sick of the palsy. Look at all the labor and the endurance and the desire that it would take somebody to physically, naturally do that. But the end result of that man is that he was healed and he walked. And when you look at that dear sister, that was sick of the blood, had a disease of the blood for 12 years. You know, we all know what it's like to wade through a crowd of people. Not too long ago, we had an experience where a whole entire football stadium of people had to be moved from the stadium down into the lower parts of that facility. And you had to look down to see where you could put your foot to make the next step. But you see, that woman, she waded through all those people. She labored. She endured. She had a desire within her heart to push all them people out of the way and get to him. And if there's one thing in this life that'll prevent you from touching the hem of his garment, it'll be people. And those people that he commanded to sit down, they sit down in a place with no food. They, didn't have, they weren't commanded to sit down at a bountiful table in a thriving city. They were commanded to sit down in a dry, dusty desert. And you see, that's one side of that experience, to be able to... Push, put the people aside. To be willing to sit down in a desert place. The other side, you know, let's grab the ship for a second. I got a lot of experience on a boat. There's a few places in my life I really love to be, or I enjoy being. I love to be at church. I enjoy being on my boat fishing. I got a lot of experience on the water. If time would allow, I could share with you some experiences of being on the water. But I can promise you right now, there's, one, there's a couple things about water that you need to understand naturally. The depth of that water and how fast that water is moving will always control the amount of fear that you have while you own it. And when you own that water, you at the mercy of it. I'll give you a quick difference between hills and mountains and waves. You climb a hill or a mountain, you can stop and take a break. You're moving. That hill and that mountain is stationary. 
When you're dealing with waves, you can't control a thing. You're at the mercy of everyone that crashes upon you. At the mercy of every one of them, without any control of them whatsoever. That's where we're thankful of that good shepherd that don't run when the wolves show up. I hope if I've been halfway clear that that experience in the church kingdom contains a labor and an endurance. It also contains to be fed and everybody gets to go home with a to-go plate. It contains a lot of desire. It contains a, a willingness to put people aside to go to him. There were healed and there were taught. This Bible has a clear commandment to come to Christ. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. Brothers and sisters, there won't be no labors. There won't be no heavy ladens. There won't be no yokes in eternal heaven. Those scriptures are speaking to the child of God right here inside the boundaries of this time world. That call to Christ, you know, I'd love to see people looking in those windows and staring through those doors and that we just surrounded by a press of people to hear this glorious gospel. <laughs> All too often, we're not. I have a desire to see that many, to see the people come, to obey this commandment, come, come unto me. You know, the Bible tells us, it says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. I can promise you now, a wrestling match is between you and someone else. I've seen very few wrestling match when it was just one person. A wrestling match is you and somebody else every time. And the objective in that wrestling match is to cast the opponent down and keep him down. That's the only real wrestling I know anything about. And you see, that battle there is not with yourself. The battle is not with flesh and blood. That battle is with Satan himself. That battle is with Satan himself. <laughs> The Bible tells us that scripture we used a minute ago. It said, be ye not conformed to this world. You see, when you're conformed to this world, this, this world is telling you the labor is too great. I don't want to sit down in this desert place that don't have no food. I want to sit down over here at this bountiful table inside this thriving city. But you know what? Remember this. Where was John the Baptist sent with the very first gospel message that was ever delivered this world? He was crying in the wilderness. In the wilderness is where he was at. You see, when you're conformed to this world, that ship, you're overwhelmed by fear and it don't have enough stability. And you say, no, I don't want to go out there. You see, you remember them men with their nets that had told all night? And they said, Lord, at thy word, I'll go out where? I'll go out into the deep. Now, you see, when you're conformed to this world, you say, oh, the water's too deep. It's too fearful. Too, too much labor. But when you transform, but when you transform by what? By the renewing of your mind by the renewing of your mind. See, now you have a mind within you that tells you. The Lord was standing on that water, and you know what? Peter walked on it. 
They didn't have but five loaves and two fishes, and they were every one filled. That man in that bed was healed. You know, I have considered what it is that would truly motivate people to come to that call that's in Christ Jesus. And like I had said to you before, most of what I had been taught my entire life was this wonderful, joyful side, and it is. I hope I've explained that. This other side is a battle. It's a true battle. If there was no battle, why would this Bible instruct us to put on the whole armor of God? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So I went to look for a place in nature where people had been highly motivated to take a stand. And the, and, and the one place that you can find as clear as a bell out here in this natural world where you can see a whole group of people become mo motivated to take a stand is right after the events of 9-11. There was 182,000 people that volunteered to join the army, join the military forces. There was about 73,000 that volunteered to join the reserves because those people had become overwhelmed with that wrestling match between them and the enemy. And they were willing to take a stand. As God's people live this life with that expectation of the kingdom, you understand that warfare. And I hope that each and every one of you will become lifted up and share it with every one of your friends and family members and the people in your community to be a good soldier. That's what will motivate people to live in this kingdom. I'm going to close in two last thoughts. You know, I highly doubt that the Lord would ever allow any one of us to experience that time when he would override the natural laws of nature and allow you to physically walk on water. I highly doubt that any of us will ever have that physical experience. But I can assure you right now, the feeling of it still remains. You know, it would have took, you, you, well, you just think to yourself what it would have took in the midst of those waves and the wind that was contrary to come down out of that ship and to step that first foot on that water. What would it would have took in you to do that? But the feeling of that still remains. It's alive in the true living God with every single one of his people in this time, in this day. The feeling of it is still here. And one might ask himself, well, why would the Lord not put this kingdom over here in the midst of this thriving city? Why would it be put... <laughs> out here in the wilderness? Why would one have to sit down in a desert place? Why couldn't we sit down at a table full of bounty? Why would we have to labor to bring that man through the roof to put him in his midst or wade through all them people? Why would we have to do all those things? The Bible tells us this. It says, for he hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and he had chosen the mighty things of this world to confound the weak. Confound means to move against your expectations. If you have an expectation of perceiving it, that's how it's going to be. You have missed the mark. I'll say that again. You have missed the mark. You see, you go over there and read the Gospel of John chapter 13. There's a good example right there of where, where the Lord moved against Peter's expectations. Peter said to him, he said, Lord, thou shalt never wash my feet. 
He was not expecting him to wash his feet, but you know, this world would consider that ordinance foolish. You see, he confounded the foolish. But he, can, he had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Why isn't that kingdom over here in a thriving city? Why isn't it at a table of bounty? One might ask himself that question many times about why. But we sing a song. We sing a song. Every one of you know it by heart. We sing it every time we meet just about, and I love it to death. It's amazing grace. And you consider this, my dear brothers and sisters, if he would have done these things in those places that would have satisfied your expectations, how would his grace been amazing. May the God of heaven bless you. Let's stand and sing one verse of number 43. Number 43. I love to sing the Lord below in his church, his way. Again, we are most thankful for the opportunity and the invitation to come be with you folks this weekend. I've greatly enjoyed our visit. I appreciate what Brother Travis brought before us. And of course, we thank the Lord for his goodness and mercy, most of all. <clears throat> I want to speak to you, if the Lord, to be pleased about the matter of truth. The Apostle John said in his second epistle that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I believe I'm among a people that love truth and want to walk therein. The Savior said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now the truth will free you from Satan's deceptions and his snares and his traps that he lays before God's people. There are folks who say we're not sure that we have the truth you know because god didn't preserve the original documents the, the actual autographs of the prophets and the apostles the pieces of vellum or or parchment or whatever they wrote on but god promised he would preserve his word he didn't promise to preserve the originals but he promised he would preserve his word and we have every confidence that he's done that but truth, as you know, it doesn't always receive uh, much of a hearing. It's true in our day. And as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. It was true back in Isaiah's day. I want to read from Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, as Isaiah lamented the condition that Israel was in back in his day, beginning in verse 13. He said, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the, word, from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. So truth doesn't receive much of a hearing most of the time. And it was true when our Lord walked the earth, you'll find over in John chapter eight, as he spoke with his detractors, those that vilified and ridiculed our Lord, the unbelieving Jews. He said in John eight in verse 40, he said, but now you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth. Now, the truth is not hidden from the unbelieving world. Christ didn't say you seek to kill me, a man that hid the truth from you. They hated him because he told them the truth. And as I said, we live in a day when truth doesn't have much of a hearing. So, but again, it's not the truth that's hidden from people, it's the wisdom that's in the truth. Now, if you don't possess 
the wisdom of God, the truth will appear as foolishness. You know, that's what the apostle said, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But let me read to you what the apostle Paul said in writing to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> he said this. He said in beginning in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, that is mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now they heard the Savior speak the truth, but they didn't have the wisdom of God. It was foolishness to them. They had no use for it. But I'm thankful, as we have already indicated, that the Savior has preserved the truth for his people. And that's what we're to earnestly contend for, what the Lord has left here on record for us. And as the Savior prayed for his disciples over in John 17, he said in verse 17, he said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And we have the truth of God right here on the pages of this book. Now, you know, again, we live in a time when those, as it was back in Isaiah's day, are despised for proclaiming the truth. And we were talking there at Brother Eddie's about how uh, people don't try to hide their hatred for truth and for godliness anymore. They're very brazen and bold about it. It's become very fashionable in our day to oppose godliness and truth. But the truth is what the Lord has left on record for us here that sanctifies his people. But we're not surprised that people would turn their ears away from the truth and be turned into fables. That's what Paul instructed Timothy uh, that would happen. And that's why he said you must insist on what the scriptures teach. And sometimes, you know, even the Lord's people who have been led astray uh, don't want to hear the truth. You know, Apostle Paul, as he wrote to the churches in the area of Galatia, he said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. And uh, so the truth doesn't go down very well in a lot of places, but it is a mighty precious commodity. And what would you exchange for your understanding of truth? Now we serve a God of truth. Now we don't, none of us have the market cornered on truth. There's plenty that we don't know, plenty we need to learn. I heard the account one time of a man that was put on the stand in a criminal trial and they asked him if he swore to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you god and he said if i knew the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i would be god so none of us have the market cornered on it there's always more that we need to learn but paul said in writing to a young preacher you're to study god's word that you might be able to rightly divide the truth. Now, he didn't say divide truth from error. There's no error in this book. It's all true. But it has to be rightly divided. And if it's not rightly divided, you're going to come up with error, as for sure. And the world of religion is filled with error. I think we all understand that. Now, he said it's the Lord's purpose to sanctify his people through truth. And when we talk about sanctification, we're talking about a separation from the world. That's what truth will do for you if you receive and obey the truth. Paul said in writing again to this young preacher, Timothy, over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, the saving he's talking about here is sanctification. You'll sanctify yourself. You know, we're taught to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. He's to have first place. We're to set our affections on things above. But he says, in taking heed unto the doctrine, you will sanctify yourself and you'll sanctify others that'll take heed to what you're preaching. We were discussing yesterday on the way home about uh, what some people have chosen to call time salvation. 
And what they're talking about is deliverances that God's people receive after they've been regenerated in obeying the truth. That's what they're talking about. But the scripture, of course, that expression is not in scripture. And I was telling Brother Eddie that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of confusion, a lot of strife could be avoided if people would stick to the language of scripture, the words which the Holy Ghost teaches. When you're talking about deliverances that we enjoy here in this life, in obeying the gospel, we're talking about practical sanctification. That's what we're talking about. And sanctification is a broad subject. You know, before the world was, God set apart a people, chose a people. In his mind and purpose, and in that covenant of grace, he set a people apart. And then, you know, when we're born again, we're sanctified by the Spirit, set apart in a vital sense, set apart, called by his grace. And then those who have been set apart by God and called by his spirit are to sanctify themselves. Separate yourself, come out from the world and be a separate people. And that's the call of God to his people. And so he said, if you take heed to the truth, you'll save yourself and you'll save others who will take heed unto what you're teaching. So we appreciate the truth that the Lord has left for us. The Apostle Paul, you know, in writing to the church at Corinth, said he was all things to all men. He said that by all means I might save some. Now, surely you understand Paul couldn't give anybody eternal life. He couldn't help the Lord give anybody eternal life. You know, that's the teaching in the world of religion for the most part, that the Lord has no hands but your hands. He has no voice but your voice. He's dependent on you to help him populate the glory work. But that's not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about being as accommodating as he possibly could to the Lord's people within the bounds of Scripture that he might save them from Satan's traps and errors, that they might live a life that brings glory and honor to our Redeemer. Now, as I said, truth doesn't receive much of a hearing, and some people will tell you that there's no such thing as truth. They don't believe there's any absolutes. And they'll be quick to tell you that that's the truth, too. <laughs> now, you know, if there's no such thing as truth, how could that be the truth? You know, they, but, uh, of course, you know, people don't, uh, people don't see it that way. But we're taught to speak the truth in love. The truth is not a club to beat people over the head with. You know, I was at a meeting one time. I invited a denominational minister to come, and uh, there wasn't too many people there that evening. It was in my home church. And uh, this, this denominational minister was good enough to come. He was nice enough to attend. And when the minister took the stand, he said, I had something on my mind when I got here this evening. But after I stepped in the building, he said, my mind has changed. And he took election and predestination and just beat that man over the head with it. I mean, if it had been a hole in the floor, I'd have crawled through it. I mean, it was just, it was uncalled for. You're to speak the truth in love. We want people to know the truth. And as we said before, I believe a couple of nights ago, you know, most people would rather see a sermon than to hear one. They may not read the Bible, but they'll sure read you. And if you're walking in truth, you can certainly have and influence on people. And that's what we're supposed to do. The Lord said his people are supposed to be a light in the world in the midst of a dark, dark world that we live in. And Paul over in the second chapter to the church at Philippi made mention of that very truth. He said, I want you to be blameless. This is Philippians 2.15. I want you to be blameless, harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You know, it's a great encouragement to, minister, to the ministry when they see God's people taking heed to what they've taught. You know, it's very discouraging when you, you pour your heart out to people and they just act like, I just take it or leave it, you know. Doesn't make much difference whether you obey it or not. Uh, like a dear old sister in one of our churches years ago, she said, salvation is by grace. What else do you need to know? You know, that's sufficient. Well, I appreciate the fact that God's grace has um, been manifest to us, and that's where our salvation is rooted. 
But I want to read you something Paul said in the first chapter of the Colossian epistle. He said this in verses five and six. He spoke of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, or if you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. The grace of God in truth. Now, everybody that professes the name of Christ will talk about being saved by grace, but then they'll tell you what you got to do to get it. You know, they'll say, there's nothing you can do to save yourself, but here's what you need to do. And they got several steps, you know, that you've got to take. But I'm thankful, as Paul said to these brethren, that they had come to know the grace of God in truth, that salvation is by his sovereign grace. There's nothing we could do, nothing we can do, nothing we had a desire to do. If you understand the truth about depravity, then you know there's none that understand, none that seek after God. They're all out of the way. And so we're thankful. We are thankful indeed. We have a God of truth yeah. that loved the people with an everlasting love, came into this world and redeemed those people. And redemption is a subject that's not preached on much in the world of religion because redemption speaks of a prior relationship. You know, if you took something to a pawn shop and left it, you know, get a little loan on it, they'd give you a ticket, and you go back later and redeem that item. Now, there'll be lots of things in that pawn shop you could buy outright, but there'll be only one thing in there you can redeem, and that's the possession you left there. Redemption speaks of a prior relationship. When we were chosen by God before the world began, the truth of the matter is we were without sin when the Lord chose us, but because of the sin of Adam, we all fell under the condemnation of God. And so our Savior agreed to come into this world to redeem, to redeem, to purchase those for whom the Father had given him. And this is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, there at the end of the chapter, for ye were as sheep going astray. Now, when a person is born of God's Spirit, it's not a goat being transformed into a sheep, but it's a sheep that's been astray being gathered into the fold. We were all his sheep going astray, but are now returned into the shepherd and bishop of your soul. And so we have a redeemer that has, that has uh, redeemed us and reconciled us to God. And as Paul wrote his epistles, most every one of those epistles start out as he wrote, reminding those to whom he wrote that God is at peace with his people. Peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He has reconciled us unto himself, and he is at peace with us. And so we are thankful indeed that we believe we have the truth, and we want to contend for that truth, earnestly contend for it. In the face of all opposition, the apostle said this as he wrote to the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, you take a stand for truth, there'll be somebody that'll appreciate it. I tell you, I appreciate it. I can tell you that. And the Lord will certainly bless you for it because he is a God that rewards those that diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those that stand for truth. The Apostle Paul was set for the defense of the gospel in the face of all opposition. And we live in a world that's going to grow more, that's going to grow more hostile towards truth as time goes on. And we understand that. But I'm thankful that regardless of what generation we might live in, the grace of God is the great equalizer. God's grace is sufficient. I don't care what uh, era, what time you live in, what the situation, what the circumstances, God's grace will still be sufficient. He's left on record for us this book filled with truth. And you know, he said, my words won't pass away. The truth endures. His word is forever settled in heaven. 
And I've said this many times, if every Bible in the world was destroyed today, the truth would still be the truth. You can't destroy truth. Now, you can destroy the ink and the pages that they're written on, but you can't destroy truth. If every Bible in the world was destroyed today, the truth would still be the truth, and it will endure. And the truth is that this world's coming to an end one day, whether people believe it or not. We see it, movements want you to give them all your tax money so they can save the world. Christ said he's going to destroy the world. They want to save the world. No, he's, he's put sufficient resources here for us to use. Now, he said using it, not abusing it. We don't want to trash your place, but we'll have enough. We'll have enough as long as time lasts. The Lord provides for his creation. That's the truth. When he created this world, he provided for it in the initial creation, and he still does today, and he will yet in time to come. So I'm thankful we have a God of truth, a God who cannot lie. And the Apostle Paul said he was living in expectation of that day when we would enter into the fullness of eternal life. Now, we've received eternal life if we've been called by his grace, but we don't know the fullness of it yet. But one day we're going to enter into it. One day we're going to see our Savior as he is. And we're going to be like him. And so I am thankful for that great expectation that he has given his people. And dear friends, as I close this morning, I want to thank you that God has blessed you in this part of the country. I thank the Lord in your behalf for the faithfulness that I've seen among the people in this part of the country. I've always enjoyed coming down here. I appreciate your stand for truth and your desire to contend for the faith that was once yeah, yeah. delivered to the saints. You know, some people say there's new revelation being given. You know, these mystics will tell you God is telling them this and that and the other. And you can't find it in scripture. Well, oh, friends, it was one time delivered. And this book was closed 2,000 years ago. And so we're bound by what's recorded on the pages of this book. And I appreciate the fact that, you've, that you folks have contended for it. And I pray in time to come that that will continue to be the case. May God bless you. And thank you again for the invitation to come and be with you.